Well, I am delighted to share part four, the last part of our movement series with you all today. Uh, again, if you feel like you've been coming in kind of at the end of the movie, like today is your first or second Sunday, have no fear. Everything's posted on our app. Everything's posted online. Just go to tcat.church. You can see it on our recent messages. We've got discussion questions for you there uh, and some content to help you dive deeper. Uh, I'm not just saying that so I get more watches on YouTube. I really feel like this series uh, is beneficial to the church. And speaking of which, just so you know, we, we kind of took this series to kind of step back for a minute. And I don't, we don't do this all this often, but kind of talk directly to people to you all who are already Jesus followers. That doesn't mean that nothing I'm going to say today is beneficial to those of you that aren't yet. It's just that we kind of said, you know, there's some things happening in the world and there's some things happening in the life of our church. And so it, it just begs some questions of what we as Jesus followers are supposed to do. And so we, we took these last three or four weeks to just dig into what does the church exist for? Why are we here? You know, why, why, does it, why is the church even necessary? People have been asked that question post-COVID now for months. You know, why do we need the church and, and how does the church exist and what is our function? So we just, we just took a deep dive, right? We took a deep dive over the past three weeks. Uh, James uh, did a great job last week filling us in on what it looks like, uh, especially for the early church, what it was that we do, right? And, and who we're supposed to be and how that's supposed to work. And I really appreciate the way in which he crafted his testimony into the idea of this bigger story that God is telling that we're a part of. But if you boil everything down for the existence of the church, we came up with kind of one simple phrase, and this is the one we've been using for weeks now, and it's this, the church exists to make followers of Jesus. And that's it. This is our function, right? Now, through the years, lots of stuff has been grafted into that, and, you know, uh, lots of other things uh, get kind of piled on, or the church has multiple programs. But I know, like, for us particularly, when I first got here, we really said, like, we're not going to start anything, or we're not going to keep anything that doesn't help us do this, right? And as a staff, we took a really hard look. How is it we as a church of Tuscaloosa, we as TCAT, are making followers of Jesus? Because this is the movement that Jesus started Himself. And this is why the church exists in the first place. Now, the magnificent thing is the church has been going for 2,000 years. And, you know, when you, when you put it in that perspective, when you think about us here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, it kind of broadens our view of why we're here and what we do, doesn't it? I mean, think about this. People have been telling this story. People have been telling this story, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus for 2,000 years. And it's our, like, we're, we're the generation now, right? We're the generation of TCAT now. In fact, TCAT itself has existed for 25. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary. And some of us have been here that whole time, but, but some of us haven't. And so there's this, this understanding that we've been handed a baton. We've been, you know, the, the, the churchy way to put this is to think of Elisha and Elijah, but, but, but that a mantle, right, a, a cloak has been laid over top of us that this is our season of church. This is our season of making followers of Jesus. And so we just kind of started asking the question, well, why? Right? What, what, what do we do? How, do? how do we do this? Why does the church, how does this function work for us? And what I want to share with you today is that I think the church exists for really two big reasons. And I think this is super important. Why, why have church today? Why do we need to gather together and continue to share this story? Why do we need this, this, this movement? Why do we need this space for us on a Sunday? I think there's, there's two big things that the church accomplishes. The very first one is the church stewards the message of eternal life. As James told you last week, the gospel can be boiled down to the, the, the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And that changed everything. Look, I can't overstate this, okay? No one was expecting Jesus to walk out of the grave. No one was expecting for Jesus to, after he was crucified, to stand back up and then to see him face to face and continue teaching, okay? No one expected that. And so their lives were completely flipped upside down, not only by the teaching that he had given before he died on the cross, but after and so this whole message, okay, this whole message that Jesus set up was like, look, life is more than just birth and death and everything that happens in between. There's, there's, an, there's an eternity. There's something on the other side of this. And so the church exists as a message. Of, uh, we're stewards of that message. We are stewards of the message of Jesus. If, if we don't tell the story, who will? If we don't tell the story who Jesus is, who will? And let me just also point out, like, there are people who need to hear this. Maybe it's you sitting in this room this morning. There are people who need to hear the story that Jesus can change and transform lives, that, that Jesus has a plan, that, that, that God was doing something and up to something in the midst of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus that actually continues to shape life today. That, that they're, like myself and, and many others in this room that have been Jesus followers for a long time, our lives are different because of this message. And speaking of that, just so I can point this out, some people get upset when I say this, but it's the truth. The church also stewards the message of a better life. The, the, the church stewards this message of a better 
life. We say that, that, that following Jesus will make your life better and it will make you better at life. And what we mean by that is just the reality that following Jesus is a better way of life. I want you to think about this for a minute. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you a passage from Galatians that Paul wrote in just a second. But before I do that, I, wanna, I just want you to think about this for a second. See, the church's influence in the world cannot be overstated. The church's influence throughout the world, throughout the centuries can't be overstated. Hospitals have been built in the name of Jesus. Schools have been built in the name of Jesus. Orphans have been adopted in the name of Jesus. Lives have been changed globally because of the church. And the church is the steward that life should not look the way it looks when we take our hands off the wheel. See, when Paul was speaking to the Galatians about this, I'm just going to make this point and then we'll move on. I don't want you to miss this though, okay? When Paul was speaking to the church in Galatia, he, he, he told them, he's like, he compared these two lifestyles. And one of the lifestyles was, was all these, this sin nature stuff, was the, the way he described it. And it was a list of things that if you read it, please go to Galatians chapter 5 and read it sometime. It's not something you go, oh, I don't believe, like, that's not a bad thing. It is. These are terrible things. And he said, this is what happens when the world takes their hands off the wheel and makes whatever decision you want to make whenever you want to make it. But then he contrasts it with the life that Jesus calls us to. And I want you to just hear this for a minute, okay? So he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. And then he lists these things. It says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and forbearance, which means patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, right? These are things that are worth living out in our lives. In fact, guys, dads, this is what we want our future son-in-laws to have, right? I got three daughters. I hope every guy they bring home is this, okay? And my son, I teach him all the time. This is what I want. Like, these are not characteristics that we go, oh my gosh, like, that's just terrible. No, even if you're not a Jesus follower, we're like, I'll take some patience. Have you seen the world lately? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I love joy, peace. All these things sound great. And we're the stewards of this message. See, this is what Jesus came. He's like, look, you can take your hands off the wheel and you can let the, the sin nature and culture and stuff drive the bus in your life, but it's not gonna take you where you want it to go. But on the other hand, this better life that we're called to, this is the fruit, right? These are the things that show up when we follow Jesus. And then Paul closes it out with well, probably my favorite verse in all of Galatians. This is beautiful. You're not gonna believe that this is my favorite, but listen to this. He says, against such things there is no law. In other words, you can have as much of that stuff as you want. You can have as much peace, you can have as much patience, you can have as much kindness and love and joy and all, you can have as much of that as you want. Take it all. Whereas there's so many things in our life that even an, even, even an ounce of it wrecks things and wrecks relationships and breaks people's lives down. Paul said, hey, you can have all these things you want. There's no law. There's no box holding it in. And if you ask me, just to be completely honest, why I think this is so valid is because to live this way is bold. Right? I mean, I just, I want to be honest with you for just a second. I feel like, you know, it's not bold to go with the flow of culture. It's not bold to go with the decisions of the people that are around you, even when you know what they're doing is wrong. One of the conversations I have with my kids every morning on the way to school is that they would live how Jesus has called them to live in spite of the way the people around them might choose to live. Not that I'd want them not to love the people that are around them, but they, they, they know how to make wise choices based on the life that they're living that Jesus has called them to. That's bold. It's bold. It's bold to live that way. And I think, it's just <laughs> completely honest, the reason, okay, the reason that the message of Jesus escaped the first century is because a group of people were bold. They were bold. They didn't care. They didn't care what happened to their lives, right? I mean, just think about this. And, and if you, please read your New Testament sometime, okay? Because everybody's got access to it. It's free online. You know, if you don't have a Bible, I'll get you one, okay? But these people in the first century, they, they, were, they were persecuted in ways that we will never, ever, ever experience. Their, their, their lives were threatened constantly, but they couldn't stop talking about the life death and resurrection of Jesus. They couldn't stop confronting the culture that was around them. They couldn't stop confronting this Roman culture that said you can do whatever you want, to however you want, to whoever you want, whenever you want. They couldn't stop saying that's not okay. It's just not okay. And they lived boldly because of what they knew. And so here's my thing. I, I think it's our turn. I think it's our turn. And I don't just mean TCAT, I mean the church, okay? In 2023, the global church. I, if it can start here, then, then praise God. But, but just overall, I think the church has to understand that in order for the message of Jesus to continue, it's time for us to be bold. 
And bold doesn't mean weird, okay? Like, I know, like, some of you all, when you heard James talking about his testimony last week, and you're thinking, like, people are just going to think that I'm so weird. No, they won't, because it's your story, okay? I'm not telling you to do anything weird. Like I said, if I see you streaking through Coleman Coliseum, I will deny that I know who you are, okay? I don't care if you're holding a John 3.16 poster. I don't care if it's got scripture written on it. I will say, I have never met that person. I'll be like Peter, right? Right before Jesus went into his trial. I, I don't know you. I'll wash my hands of you. That's not what I'm talking about when I say bold, Bold means saying, you know what, Jesus has transformed my life, and I won't, not, I, I won't prevent myself from sharing that with somebody who needs to hear it. That's bold. You know, bold is saying, you know, <laughs> culture says this is okay, but God doesn't. And, and, and I know it's hard, and, and like it's going to be difficult to navigate relationships. It's going to be difficult to navigate, you know, this, this friendship and all these things that are happening around me. But like, I'm going to be bold and try, <laughs> I'm going to be bold and try to navigate this situation that I found myself in rather than just kind of going with the flow. That's bold. Doing that out of love, doing that because you love your neighbor, doing that because you love people too much to see consequences come their way. You love them too much for that. See, when you're motivated in that direction, that's bold. It's not bold to be hate-filled. That's not what I'm saying. It's not bold to to be wagging your finger. Like, I see way too much of the holier-than-now stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. It's bold to love your neighbor and to love them enough to share the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. You know, this boldness is really how our church was founded in the first place. Let me just say, like, uh, I'm just gonna take a tangent for a minute, but I think this is really important for you all to know, especially if you've never heard this story before. You see, 25 years ago, we started as a church that unchurched and dechurched people would love to attend. Now, here's what we mean by this, okay? Unchurched just means people who have never darkened the door of a church before. They don't know the story of Jesus at all. D-church means they came to church, maybe this church, maybe another church, who knows, and they got some stuff. They got hurt, or you know, they were in church for a while, and then their parents got divorced, and the church didn't know what to do with that, so they kicked them all out, or something happened, and somebody got arrested, and they were like, maybe you shouldn't come here anymore, and they got all this baggage, and all this church hurt, and all this stuff, and then like, we don't have any place to go. TCAT was founded as a church where those people would come and feel as comfortable as possible to be confronted by nothing else but the gospel. See, we, we don't shy back from, if you haven't figured this out for me yet, I'm just you know, like letting you behind the curtain. We don't shy back from confronting you with the gospel. But you get enough stuff that stresses you out, right? And so, you know, we just decided we would create a space where the only thing that would be confrontational in anything that we do on a Sunday morning would just be the truth of God, because that's it, right? Well, you're going to experience love and compassion and, and kindness and all those fruits of the Spirit from all of us here in this church because we really do love you. We really want you to be here, but we know that Jesus is life, death, and resurrection is what we needed. And for 25 years, we've been doing this. That's based, I wasn't here when they founded it, but I'm going to make an assumption because this is the way I've been describing it from now on, and so I'm just co-opting the story, okay? Bill, Steve, you guys forgive me for co-opting 25 years ago when I was 12 when you all planted this church. Um, but uh, I co-opted it, and I said, like, our motivation, and this is our motivation now going forward, but our motivation is scriptural. And it comes from this conversation that the disciples were having in Acts chapter 15. See, in Acts chapter 15, there's this big council of Jerusalem. And, you know, if you're not a Bible reader, all you really need to know is that the, the church had, had gotten big and this movement had gotten complicated. And so they were finally getting together to talk about what to do with Gentiles. And those were people who weren't Jewish. How are we supposed to bring them into the church? And do they need to become Jews first before they become Jesus followers? And how does all this work? And they were having this conversation. And guess what? Your life was actually involved in the conversation they were having that day. Because guess what? I would say 99.9% of us in here are Gentiles, okay? I actually know we have some Jewish people. Um, I don't know. The lights are too bright. I can't see if you're here. But I know that we have some who are in our congregation. But most of us, most of us are Gentiles. Since they were talking about you and me. And they had this conversation. What are we supposed to do for these people who are turning to God? And what ended up happening was they, they argue back and forth, and Paul shares this really, like, you know, like from his heart moment, and, and all the, you know, this, it just kind of gets quiet. And then James, the brother of Jesus, the James, the brother of Jesus, who was not a Jesus follower during Jesus' life, James, the brother of Jesus, who actually became a Jesus follower after he saw Jesus raised from the dead. Because, of course, like, I can't imagine my brother calling me Lord until I'd done something like that. And his brother's like, yeah, Jesus is cool and all, but, you know, I'm a brother too. Until the resurrection. And then James became an avid follower of Jesus as the Lord and Savior of his own life and actually gave his own life for the church. He was martyred in that way. So James stands up and everybody gets quiet. And James says this. 
It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, he said, we should make it as simple as possible for people to hear the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And this was it. And then he boils down all their laws and all their rituals and just a handful of things. They write a letter. They send it out to the people who are Gentiles and say, God bless you. Go in peace. And this was his statement. We should not make it difficult. I got this hanging in my office. The staff and I talk about this verse all the time. We don't want to make it difficult for people who are turning to God. Now, there is turning involved in this, okay? Right? This whole turning thing is a big deal. We want to give you Jesus, and we feel like he's calling you in a new direction. But we're going to make that as easy as we possibly can. That's really the point of why we do what we do. And some of you all have experienced that firsthand. And when I told stories a few weeks ago about church experiences that some of us have had, I saw a lot of nodding heads. Right? We, we just want to give you Jesus. And look, if you're not a Jesus follower yet, I just let you behind the curtain of our whole thing. Okay? You're, you're in. And you know all the programming, you know all the ideas behind everything we're trying to do. And we believe in this so much because Jesus has changed our lives. My life is different. My life is different. And so we find ourselves kind of at this crossroads where we finished 25 years of ministry. And in the midst of this 25 years, uh, this transition into the next 25, as I've been calling it, we kind of have this space where we're like, what are we going to do now? And I feel like in my heart, okay, uh, through, through the time of prayer that we're spending and, and through just observing things that are going on, I feel like God is up to something in Tuscaloosa County in a big, big, big way. I think God is up to something in the world in general, but specifically here in Tuscaloosa County, God is up to something. And I think there's a massive opportunity. I think there's a massive opportunity for the church to be able to present the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus in the movement we've been called to all along. And, but here's the question. Are we going to be good stewards of the opportunity that we've been given? See, the word steward means that you, you, you thriftily and carefully examine the opportunity, carefully examine the resources, carefully examine, and then make the best decision that you can, no matter what. Now, I have a, a really good friend who I was talking to on the phone this week, and the way that I described him to him is I said, you know, you do the right thing no matter what the cost is, and I really appreciate that about you. You do the right thing no matter what the cost is. I, I think that's what this means. Are we going to do the right thing? Are we going to take this opportunity that we've been given? And I think the way for us to do that, I, I'm going I'm to make an ask of all of us, okay? So the next few minutes, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something. And this ask that I have for you is scriptural. It's based on what we've been talking about for three weeks. But there's, th there's four things that I just feel like if we can do this as a church, and I am asking you, okay, I'm asking you as the pastor and the leader and the shepherd of this congregation, I'm asking you to do these things. And so I'm going to use I statements for these because I want you to know this is from my heart and it's something I've prayed out. But I'm going to ask you to do four things. And the very first one is I want you to be bold in your invitations. I want you to be bold in your invitations, not because we want to be a big church, Right? Not, not so we can be a big church, bigger than somebody else or whatever. That's not the point. I want you to experience this place through the eyes of someone who's unchurched or de-churched because you invited them to come. You know what happens? Do you know what happens when you invite a friend who's unchurched or de-churched to come to this church? You start looking at everything completely different. You hope I don't mess up the message that day. You hope they play that song that you like so much. You hope the coffee's the perfect temperature and the line's not too long and check in when they take their kids. You hope that the, 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 there's greeters at the door that are smiling. You hope that it's a perfect presentation of the gospel. You are looking at this place completely different and we need Need you to do that. We need you to evaluate this place through the eyes of someone who is far from God so that we can continue to get better doing what we do at sharing the gospel with people who need to hear it. I need you to do that. Just think about this for a minute, okay? I'm not, I don't want to like put something on you, but I want you to think about this. Imagine, right? Imagine that you invite someone to come to this place and you get to see them go past through the waters of baptism. They, they came from a place of being unchurched or dechurched, and they, they may not even say your name on stage, but you're crying in your chair because you knew you were the person that invited them to come and hear the gospel, and then they passed through the water of baptism into new life in Jesus, and you got to be a part of that. See, our whole thing, this, this, is, this is language you've heard before, okay, but our whole outreach model is called invest and invite. Invest and invite. We want you to invest in friendships, and then when, you, when the time is right, risk relationship and risk friendship to invite them to be a part of one of our environments that's happening at the church. 
You all have people in your life that you know, okay? People that you've been hesitant about inviting or people that you know who desperately need to hear the gospel. We want to give you space. We want to partner with you in evangelism. And I know that word gets beat up so much lately, but we want to partner with you in evangelism. We want to partner with you as we share the gospel. You see, when you invite someone to come into this place, we will take over sharing the story to them for the very first time. You just have to say, come sit with me. And we will do our absolute best to present the life, death, and resurrection with Jesus in a winsome way that will lead them, hopefully, into a growing relationship with Jesus. This is it. This is all we do. We don't, you know, we don't send out mailers. You know, we don't, we don't have fancy, uh, we don't even have anybody that does the ads professionally at our church. This is it. It's you. We just want to partner with you in evangelism. Number two, I ask you that you would be bold in your volunteering. Bold and you're volunteering. Here's the thing, we are growing like crazy. If you haven't noticed this yet, um, I just, I wanted to put this number in perspective for you. My first Sunday here in 2021, we had 60 people. The nine o'clock service had two people in it, by the way. Uh, but I think there were 60 total for the day. Uh, and there's about 200 people here. There's 330 chairs, something set up in the room today, and you include the kids. So we are growing like crazy. I just had a conversation with our kids director this week about the need to knock down a wall because we have so many preschoolers and so many babies that we need more space. We are growing like crazy. And that's due to, again, your all's faithfulness and, and, and you all continuing to invest and invite and being a part of people's lives. And, and that's due to God's grace and God's providence. But the truth is, we can't keep this growth up without you. <laughs> we just can't. We can't sustain it. In fact, when I'm looking at my staff right now and they're going like, I'm going to have 50 kids back here. I need like five more volunteers or whatever. And some of y'all are super hesitant to volunteer in kids programming, but the ones of you that are, that, that, like I want to hug you, by the way, all of you that are willing to go back and volunteer in kids, here's the thing that I know. And you may not know this if you're so hesitant about it, but this is what I know. If you're hesitant to volunteer in kids, you need to know that those who do it weekly <laughs> or bi-weekly, they do it because they understand what it is they're really doing. I need to tell you something, we don't do child care here. We don't, we don't do child care. That's not what's happening over here. What's happening is volunteers are planting a marker. They're planting something deep, deep down inside of the hearts and minds of the children that are in those rooms so that by the time they're in middle school or high school, they understand the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus so well that when they get tempted to make decisions that lead them away from God, God has been planted so deep inside of them that they don't want to turn. We want to partner with parents. One of the things we do here that's, that's different than a lot of other places is we don't want to think that we are the only disciples in your kids' lives. We want to partner with you. We want to make you better parents. Like, and the thing is, we're not going to, some of you will volunteer for this or be hesitant to volunteer for this. We have really high standards for who gets to volunteer in our kids' programs. And you might volunteer and we say no and you get credit for trying and we get credit for keeping our standards high, right? Um, but, but the truth is, like, seriously, we love our kids too much. We're not just going to stick you in a room for an hour with a kid and say good luck. We love those kids too much. We work way too hard to do that. And if you're hesitant and you're on the fence about volunteering in kids, look, we need you, they need you, and I've talked to people, some of the, some of the men that are in this group, but just they, just, they blow me away at the way they volunteer with our kids. And they share with me their heart that like, look, I know I'm sharing the gospel with these kids. I'm giving them a seed. I'm planting something in them that will carry out long term. But look, it's not just kids. Our youth program went from three students when we hired Andrew to 50 what, 40? What do we have, 51 at the last thing? I mean, that's insane, okay? That's insane. We could use more volunteers in our students. We could use more volunteers in our guest services. We have a place for you, I promise. We have a place for you. And I'm going to ask you to be bold. And bold might mean you're going to volunteer to do something you wouldn't normally volunteer to do. You know? I'm starting to think that I'm the only person in this church that can't sing. Like every time I turn around, there's somebody new up here singing and amazingly. I'm like, I'm getting punked, aren't I? Like this is some sort of joke. Um, and so maybe, maybe you can sing. I don't know. I don't, maybe you can play an instrument. I don't know. I can't. It's not me. But the thing is, we need you. Okay, we need you. And we can't do what God has called us to do. We can't keep this pace up without you. We can't. The third thing I want you to be bold in, and I want you to be bold in your giving. And I want to, I want to say something about this because some of you all are going to think, oh, there it is. Okay, and, and those of you that are on the fence about church and you're not givers here right now, you're like, there it is. There's the thing. Well, let me just say something. If you're, if you're not a giver here right now, I want to say something. You're going to think I'm crazy. And the money people probably don't want me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you're not giving to, you know, if you're not a giver with us right now, here's the thing. We don't need your money. You think we need your money, right? You walk in here and you think like, wow, look at this place. You know, they've got all the crazy thing. We, we don't need 
your money. If, if all of our goal was to pay the staff and to keep the lights on and to keep it looking exactly the way it is, now we don't need, we, we, we've got that, okay? That's, that's what we're doing right now. And the reason is because there are families in this church, there are people in this church that are so bought in and so on mission that they give and give and give and give and give and give and they don't have a hesitation about it. And I call and I ask them, I'm just so grateful, like, oh my gosh, I just can't believe the way that you give. And then we love this church. We love what's happening. And so if our goal is just to stay exactly the way we are, we, I don't need you to start if you haven't started yet. But the truth is that's not our goal, right? I mean, our goal is to reach more people, to share the gospel. Our goal is to grow and to move. And look, if you're not a percentage giver with us yet, you, you, you have any idea how many crackers your kids eat next door and, and, and how many supplies that we're getting? I mean, come on, what are, you, what are you waiting for, right? I mean, seriously. And here's the big thing. All right, it's not just bold. It's not just bold with giving just because we want to get bigger. It's bold with your giving because when you do bold things in your money, God does bold things in your life. He does. For those of us that have been tithers, like I, I, I'm... <laughs> So fortunate that I got taught this as a kid, and I mean this when I say it is really hard to teach generosity to an adult who's never had to open their hands with their money before. It is hard. But when you do, and you allow God to be the Lord of your money and the Lord of your life, your life gets better. It does, I guarantee you. That's not prosperity teaching, that's reality. And so pick a percentage. Right? It doesn't have to be 10% to start. Start with three, five. Get a calculator out, okay? And say, we're gonna start with 3%. We're gonna start with 5%. We're gonna start with 6%, whatever it is. And pick a percentage and get on board financially, giving boldly with your money and see what God does in your life and see what God does in our church. There's so many things. Just this past week, I, I didn't know if I was gonna mention this, but I'm feeling led to say it, so I'm gonna say, say this part now. Just two weeks ago, we were, we, members of our staff were at a conference and there's this initiative that we really feel strongly that we need to be a part of. And uh, we got to the end of it. It was a great presentation. We feel like this could really shape the, the next 10 years of ministry in our church. It could help us reach people beyond our borders and do things in our community. Um, but it's $5,000 for us to participate in the initial study to see if we, so we um, qualify. And we looked around and said, that's not in our budget. That's not like in our yearly budget right now. That $5,000 is not there. And so I had several staff people come to me and they pledged half the money. Your staff pledged half that $5,000 because they believe in that initiative so much. And so I just, I feel like God said you don't have because you don't ask. And I just want to present to you the fact that we are $2,500 short on an initiative we think could make a massive difference. And I could pull it from the budget. I could find it and pull it somewhere. Or one of you all or some of you all or many of you all could say, you know what, I think that's something God's doing and I want to give to be a part of that. Number four, I need you to be bold with your prayers. I need you to be bold with your prayers. Um, <laughs> here's the thing I said it a couple weeks ago uh, many of the times most of the stuff we pray for it's, it's kind of us you know it's us it's what's going on in my life and a few random sick people to come up my small group and, and you know all of that but it's mostly like what's going on with me now we, we need you to be bold with your prayers for what God is doing here what God is doing through this place but even beyond that, if you haven't been following any of this revival that's been going on in Asbury, or any of the revival that's kind of broke out along, um, many of our college students around the country, revival has broken out in those places, and yeah, the church people are starting to pick at it, and you know, denominations are starting to claim it, and all the stuff the church normally does to wreck things when, when God shows up, but, but God has shown up in a really big way. And that happened because a group of college students started praying. And they weren't just praying for them. They were saying, God, would you please move in our community? And that's why I want you to pray. God, enable me. Remember that the message, um, James, had you read it out loud again last week? Enable me, enable me to share your word. Stretch out your hand. Enable me to share your word with boldness. That's the kind of stuff I'm asking you to pray. Would you pray boldly for our church? Would you pray boldly for God to move in your own individual life that may lead to him moving in someone else's life through you? Would you pray for our kids? Would you pray for our students and our college students? Would you pray for our staff? Would you pray for our leadership that we would just be connected and rooted and grounded in what God would have us do? Because this is, I, I cannot exaggerate this. This is a massive opportunity that we are sitting at today. We are in a, we are in a crossroads of, of a church that has reclaimed their vision and reclaimed the mission of making disciples. And we are moving forward in a way that no one expected us to. So will we take advantage of this moment? Only if we pray. Only if you're bold with your prayers and your giving and your volunteering and your invitations. 
I want to read you the last words that I'm going to hush, okay? These are the last words that are recorded in the book of Acts. Um, and at the very end, Paul has been sent off to Rome to be imprisoned. And the, the crazy thing is, Paul got to Rome before the charges against him did, and so they didn't really know what to do with him. And so he's kind of in house arrest for a while, and then eventually he's released and rearrested, and Nero has him executed about 67 AD. Um, he has this, this voice, this mouthpiece of the gospel that it, none has existed like before, and I, honestly, I don't think it has existed like again, is, is stomped out. His, 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 his mouth is closed in 67 AD, but the movement of the church didn't stop. And Paul actually kind of, like, I don't know if he meant to be prophetic, but he kind of was prophetic in the last words that he says. Listen to this from the book of Acts chapter 28. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. How do we know that, right? That we would be here in Tuscaloosa listening to this message. And it says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Chained with guards, right? He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all, say this word out loud with me, boldness, with all boldness and without hindrance. We have been invited to be a part of that movement. You and I have become the stewards of the message of eternal life and the message of a better life. And people will hear that if we're bold. People will hear that message if TCAT chooses to be bold today. If you and I choose to be bold. Well, so here's what's going to happen. The band's going to come back out here in just a second. Um, but I want to say, on your way out today, you're going to get, if I can get it off of here. There we go. On your way out the door today, our ushers are going to hand you this bracelet. And it says, be bold on it. And everybody gets one. And we've got plenty. If you want to take one for your kids, take an extra one. We, we, we've got plenty. Um, but I want you to put this on, uh, and I want you to, every time you, you think about those four things, all right, I want you to look down and, and be bold. Every time you, you decide that, you know, I don't know about volunteering, I'm a little nervous, be bold. I don't know about inviting that friend of mine, it, you know, I don't know how that'll go, be bold. I don't know about writing that check, be bold. You know, how am I supposed to pray today? Be bold. And think about what God might do in you and through you and in spite of you in a movement that calls you to be bold. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this story. Gosh, gosh, this story of the death, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that has changed our lives. God, there's people in this room that don't know you, and, and today's the day for them to make a commitment to you. There's people in this room that have been following you for a really long time, and now is the time for them to get off the bench and end the game. And for those of us that are somewhere in between, God, call us deeper in relationship with you today. And get us in and help us to be bold. We love you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.